Dr. Ogden, thank you for joining me once again. Hello, good to be back. We're discussing the werewolf in antiquity. We really are being transformed literally in this episode into <laughs> werewolves and screech owls and all sorts of things. Could you define what a werewolf is for the audience? And especially in relation to your folklore first methodology in the book. Well, in terms of looking at werewolves in the ancient world, I take a very broad view. I'm happy to classify as a werewolf any entity that is at some point a human or humanoid and at some point a wolf or lupine. And I don't make any rules beyond that. For example, one of the famous figures in ancient werewolfism is Lycaon. He's a bad man who similarly attempts cannibalism or tries to con the gods into eating human beings, and he's punished by being transformed into a wolf. Now, a very distinguished French scholar has said, well, no, he's not a werewolf, because he's, first of all, he's just a man, and then the god strikes him, and then he's a wolf, and that's not a werewolf. Well, maybe, but it's actually quite difficult in the end to develop a sort of criteria for distinguishing the Kaon from our other werewolves. So I don't make any rules about whether you're a man to start with or a wolf to start with, about how often you transform, about whether you transform back. Anybody who basically displays both those elements, or in both human and lupine elements at the same time for that matter, I'm happy to bring into the mix and to consider. Now, as far as my methodology is concerned, I don't have a methodology, I have a belief. And that belief is that the overriding determinant of werewolfism in the ancient world is folklore, is stories. I should say that the evidence for werewolves is very diverse, centrifugal, and very hard to put together into anything coherent. But it seems to me that that's our one chance of, of doing it if we start with folklore. So I think every other manifestation of werewolfism in the ancient world is basically derivative of the traditional storytelling. So that's where the werewolf starts. So, for example, most people who've talked about the wealth in the ancient world have fixated on this rite of passage or rite of maturation associated with Mount Lycaon. So again, Mount Lycaon is where Lycaon himself lived. There's this rite of passage whereby some young men hang their clothes on a tree and then swim across a pond, emerge on the other side of the pond as a wolf, live as a wolf for a couple of years. And if they manage to abstain from eating human beings during that time, they can come back and then they can recover their clothes and their human form. That's a rite that's described in a number of ancient sources. And goodness knows what that actually relates to in terms of the real world or what actually happened, that, that dreadful question. But a lot of people have taken that as the starting point, And they think that everything about werewolves in the ancient world is to do with maturation, rice of maturation. And uh, I think that's back to front. So I mean, I think we start with stories and the, the werewolf of the story is then used in metaphorical ways, I would say, for various purposes. So one of those metaphorical ways is indeed to describe a brief period of ritual wildness to separate these Arcadian young men from their childhood, their pre-warrior status from their adulthood, their post-warrior status. Another metaphorical use of werewolfism because etiological. There's all sorts of etiologies associated with the figure of Lycaon himself. And another metaphorical use of, of werewolfism is in terms of medicine and disease. We like in Galen. To, yes, and in, indeed, like a, in a series of ancient medical writers, actually, they had this notion that you could develop something called lycanthropy. Of course, we use that Greek word now as uh, just the mean werewolfism. But for them, it wasn't werewolfism. It, it was specifically the disease of people that imagine themselves to be wolves. But again, the whole concept of that disease is sort of metaphorically dependent upon a knowledge of werewolves to start with. And where is that knowledge gained from? It's a story world. you know. So here I am, I'm arguing hard for that. But I expect actually most of your viewers are probably pushing at an open door because if I ask your viewers, where do werewolves live? They're going to say, well, in stories, of course in great stories, you know, in whether it's in pulp fiction or in movies, that's where they live. And the ancients didn't exactly have pulp fiction. They didn't have movies, but they did have good stories of, of just the same sort. And that, in my view, is where ancient werewolves lived. The ancient world didn't have pulp fiction. Kind of imagine something like Flagon of Paley's like, Book of Miracles is kind of like the weird tales of the time. They didn't have pulp fiction. They did have fora or uh, places in which weird tales were told 
again, those are the sorts of places where we can imagine, I think, werewolf tales being rehearsed. Our best werewolf tale, for example, is told in the course of Petronius's novel, The Satyricon, and it's told by a character at a dinner party. And it's told as a pair of competing tales. And so Nicaros is the character who's telling the, the werewolf tale, and then Trimalchio tells a tale about Strix witches. Both very lurid, very interesting, very entertaining tales. Um, and obviously they're, they're competing with each other. Okay, so that's a little pair. You can imagine at a sort of real dinner party, 10 people. You know, you go around the circle, everybody tells a story like, I think the analogy of campfire horror stories is a really good one here for us. And also we do know from various allusions in ancient texts that in the Roman Empire, at any rate, including, I suppose, the Greek world of the Roman Empire, there was this phenomenon of the Aritalagus, and he was basically, I think we can say, a professional weird storyteller, and they would be paid to come into dinner parties and tell these stories. When you mention Phlegon of Tralles, it's often thought that those stories may originate in, or at least have been propagated in that sort of context as well. And it's just sort of branching out from dinner party. I mean, dinner party sounds a bit glamorous and a bit middle class, doesn't it? I mean, I think any form of social gathering, really, I should say convivial gathering. But another place where these stories would really have thrived and been retold would have been inns, pubs, you know, bars, the bars of the ancient world, the Tavernae, because it's amazing how many weird stories, whether it were werewolf stories and other supernatural stories, include an innkeeper somewhere or other. Well, why, no, why should that be? I think that right, they're either the there. protagonist or they're taking yeah. part in some way. Yeah, like the Aesop story, right, with the, yes, the guy who's pretending to be a werewolf. I don't think somebody sat down to sort of collect one day or create a nice group of weird stories all linked together by the theme of an innkeeper. I think it's just that these stories are told, in, and Bob, and you're trying to act as make them real, relate them to your immediate environment, and so mine host is often going to turn up in the story you're telling. You know. Or there was an innkeeper very much like this one who, you know? That opens up another can of worms just in terms of like the Strix, which you point out in the source book, werewolves, their function ultimately is to serve the purposes of a good story. They're also found in association with a myriad of different supernatural entities like witches and yes. ghosts and the dead in general. So you're at this dinner party, this lavish banquet being thrown by the nouveau riche, very mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. Trimalchio, and he has his friend, Nicaros tell this story about the wolf and, and i love when he tells the story kind of reminds me of eucrates house and yeah. philip sudes yeah. where uh, they say the same thing they're like no amount of money could make me lie about something yeah. like this and, and it reminds yeah. me of lucian when he's on the moon and he goes down to look at the mirror and he's like oh if you don't believe me go up yourself so they're telling stories and like you said there was technically a word for werewolf and the word that they're using for the transformation is not anything related to werewolves and it's since it's in latin but the word is skin changer right uh, versus yeah. Yeah. and you talk about how these two stories, the story that Nikeros tells, and then Trimalchio tells the story about the favorite slave boy who mm -hmm. dies. And then the witches are outside. The slave guy goes out and he like stabs one of them, but then they go back and then they find that the child's body has been, well, I mean, the body's there, but I guess they took out the organs and then just put in straw or whatever. Even back at these earliest sources, the werewolf and the strigai, um, I don't know if you could define that, the Strix witch. Yeah. So the Strix witch, perhaps I should begin by saying that although they're kind of associated with witches, they probably weren't on the whole considered to be mortal women. Maybe sometimes they were. Often they were, I think, conceived of rather as, as demons. Like and a lamia or a... That's or exactly where I was Gilgamesh. going. In many ways, they're the equivalent of the Greek lamia. So they're basically child stealers, ba especially baby stealers. They can conceive of as old women in form, but they can also transform themselves into some sort of raptor bird or a creature that has the affinities of a raptor bird. And the screech owl, right? The yeah, Strix is thought to mean screech owl as well. And in this form, they penetrate domestic houses and steal babies and young children. Either they steal them away, or they eat them, or they gut them, or more sinisterly still, they have the, the ability to penetrate their bodies imperceptibly and remove key organs. Again, no doubt to eat. But then the, the child is left to sort of die slowly or sort of wither away. Again, nothing about the Strix is sort of fixed. I mean, there's also a notion that they can seemingly sort of penetrate 
houses in a sort of soul projected form or reduce themselves to a spirit and they can get through a little crack or a keyhole or something so that's a sort of parallel to a sort of i suppose penetrating a child's body imperceptibly you can also yeah. penetrate the house as it were imperceptibly. there are very vague suggestions that these creatures can also transform themselves into wolves so there is perhaps a slight thematic link there between the, the two Petronius stories on that basis, although there's certainly no mention of a, of a wolf in Petronius's strict story. I love how you tie the folklore throughout the centuries and, and you, like you make these observations that at the very least, these things are shape-shifting into some kind mm -hmm. of creature or animal that's associated in the ancient mind with civility you know, in the city mm -hmm. versus running into the wild as a creature. And that goes back to my point earlier about how the werewolf is associated with these figures. The werewolf is also associated not just with the Strix, but also with ghosts and dragons as well, depending on the lore. Maybe you're thinking about the hero of Temesa, but the point is that of the implications of some ancient sources, a girl is sort of annually given, sort of left out for the hero of Temesa, this seemingly demonic werewolf figure, described as a sort of ghost in a wolf skin, or a demon in a wolf skin, to come and get, and presumably kill. The reason I was sort of drawing comparisons with dragons and sea monsters is just that story type of the, the virgin girl being pinned out for the sea monster or the dragon to come and eat. Just the way that phenomenon is described just aligns with that sort of story type. I wouldn't want to say the werewolves had particular affinities with dragons and beyond that. It's just that's just a sort of coincidence in, in, in a pair of story types. But we often find the werewolves associated with witches. So, I mean, arguably the very first witch of Greek literature, if you allow her to be a witch, Circe, is turning people into wolves. I mean, her house is surrounded by tame wolves and lions, which Odysseus's crewman, not Homer in his own voice, but it is one of the, the characters to whom he gives voice, clearly presumes to have been transformed from other sailors, human sailors, by Circe. I mean, Virgil's Moiris, the sorcerer, can turn himself into a wolf. We mentioned board witches, and some of those apparently can turn themselves into wolves. So, yes, so Herodotus, of course, talks about the Neuri, who are, are very obscure, but he calls them a race of sorcerers. And the main thing that they seem to do, actually, is turn themselves into wolves for a period and then turn themselves back again. Clearly, there's a strong association between witches and sorcerers and wolves there. And then sorts of associations also between wolves and, and the dead and ghosts. So in Petronius's famous story, we have the guy, Nicaros, who's just seen a, a man turn himself into a wolf in a cemetery, by the way, then sort of escape, lashing out with his sword at all the ghosts he then imagines to be attacking him. And I mentioned medical lycanthropy, the, the disease of lycanthropy. What do these people do when they catch it? Well, apparently they roll around in cemeteries. They roll around in graveyards. Why? I don't know. But nonetheless, there are these thematic associations that are there, you see. Why witches? Why wizards? Why ghosts? Well, actually, I'm going to come back once again to the place which I started, which is that these guys all live together in the world of the weird traditional story that you tell at your dinner party or in your pub. It's just like, let's say, the ancient equivalent of the Hammer horror movie. I don't know if your American viewers are familiar with those British horror movies of the 60s and the 70s. Uh, classics yeah, to I'm us. I'm a big fan. Okay, that is to me. But again, Love horror film. yeah, if you just think of the sort of mix you get in there, you know, the vampires, the werewolves, the ghosts, you know, different movies, but, you know, the sort of monster you're going to get featured. There's a sense in which even if, you know, the vampire isn't meeting the werewolf in the same story, nonetheless, there's a sense in which they all inhabit the same world, if you know what I mean. It's a bit like that. Yeah, it's like equivalent of the shared cinematic universe. So uh, the shared cinematic universe, yes, that's a very good, very good way of putting yeah. it, yeah. One of the things I really loved in this book was the chapter recounting all the famous athletes yes and the yeah. relationship to werewolfism you know demarcus theogenes euthymus I found these all wild it'd be like if like 100 years from now brock lesnar had these legends yeah. grow up around yeah. him about wrestling a bear and saving a virgin or something so i didn't know if you could just yeah. talk about these a little bit it's just wild well it is a strange phenomenon and it seems quite limited in time as well, because the, the, the athletes concern all seem to have been historical figures, by the way. And most of them seem to have lived around 500 BC. That seems to be the era in which these people lived. So they were all distinguished Olympic victors in one sport or another. And all these weird stories were told about them. 
Now, they don't all involve wolves, but some do. Euthymus of Lockery, he is the champion of the story of the hero of Temesa, the hero of Temesa being the bad guy. Don't get us wrong. The yes. hero of Temesa is yeah. not the good guy. <laughs> yeah, hero in the sense of powerful dead man, as it were. He's the ghost, the demon in the wolf skin that demands the virgins. And Euthymus comes along and chases him into the sea, and that's the end of him. Then Milo of Croton, he's quite a favourite of mine. He's involved, well, not with werewolves, but with just good old wolves. It's a good story, though. I mean, apart from all, all the other sort of strange feats he's involved with, he's wandering in the forest one day, of course, just where we expect to find the wolves. And he finds somebody trying to split a tree open by the, the technique of having a major sort of cut in the side and then gradually driving wedges in. And he thinks, oh, well, I could finish this job myself. So he just sticks his hand in the crack and begins to pull. The wedges fall out, of course, as he loosens the crack, but then the tree snaps back on him and he's stuck. So he's stuck there permanently, and then that night the wolves come along and eat him, and that's the end of Milo. But then the most interesting of these stories for us is the story of Demarcus. And again, this story has to be reconstructed a bit because the sources for it are confused, and they mix it up in a strange way with that Arcadian rite we were talking about. But as I reconstruct it, Demarcus... Uh, was tricked into eating human flesh. It's a long story, isn't it? <laughs> At a sacrifice to Zeus Lycaeus. Now, interesting here, of course, is the comparison with the story of Lycaon, who is also involved with cannibalism and trying to feed human flesh to people. But he, but having eaten that human flesh, I suppose, as a wolf would, he becomes a wolf. He's transformed into a wolf for nine years. We're not told how he how he got back into human form, but somehow he did. Maybe it was a nine-year sentence, or maybe he found some sort of solution. I don't know. But after that, he became a brilliant and successful athlete. Uh, because it's not clear, did his period as a wolf sort of build up his agility? Is that why he became a great athlete? Or is it just that, as a great athlete, retrospectively, we have to find a weird story for him? I, mean, I should say, many of these stories associated with that, I mean, Euthymus comes out of it well, and Milo comes out of it looking like a fool, I suppose. So often they come out of these stories looking, you know, not good at all. Cleomedes of Astypalaia, his story is rather strange. He becomes mad when, on a technical decision, he's deprived of a prize in boxing. And he goes mad and runs off into a schoolhouse, interesting evidence, supposedly, for a schoolhouse in 500 BC, which is held up by a central pillar, and he pulls it down, killing all the children inside it, yeah, like 64 kids. It was... Yeah, and then he's pursued by, you know, by the angry townspeople. He hides himself in a chest. And when they open the chest, he's disappeared. So again, all these weird stories about these athletes are around 500 BC. Why do you invent weird stories about these guys? It's strange, isn't it? It's clearly a way of marking them out as special, as memorable. But the seeming negativity of the stories is curious. It really is. I mean, I must admit, if I was writing that bit of the book again today, I would probably include a couple of other things and that is also a couple of spartan kings um sort of kings at any rate of about the same time cleomenes the mad cleomenes supposedly mad cleomenes so he was a brilliant spartan king who basically put together the peloponnesian league but again the story is that he went mad and he was put in stock managed to get hold of a knife and and, and killed himself by cutting his legs into strips <laughs> and then on the other side of the uh, the persian invasion you have again these weird stories about Pausanias the regent so not quite king, but almost. And so he was the guy who saved Greece from the Persians in the Battle of Catia. Without Persenius, no classical period. I mean, the greatest of all the Greeks, really. And yet there's weird stories about his end, about him raping a virgin in Byzantium, being pursued by her ghost, eventually being bricked up by the Spartans inside the temple of Athena Chalcioikos and starved to death there. So for some reason, I assume around about that 500 BC time, you know, the, the, the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 5th century, clearly a fashion for conveying greatness by attaching weird and often strangely negative stories to these great men. It's a, a weird way of thinking, but it's just there. I find it hard to explain, but all these great men with these manifestly fictional, in most cases, stories attached to them. What's going on? I just don't know. I just don't know.
I kind of see these hero stories about the athletes during that period of time as kind of like the first draft of what later became Hey Geography. They got it right with Hey Geography, and then Eunapius got it even better with the Neoplatonic Saint stuff with his lives with the philosophers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, interesting ways of marking people out as exceptional. I just imagine, yeah, yeah, Yeah. Macho Man Randy Savage or Brock Lesnar have these insane stories about wrestling a Kraken with his bare hands. We mentioned the dinner party. We mentioned the campfire stories. Another thing I'm reminded of is Apuleius' golden ass, where yeah. the narrator is on the road and he meets this guy, yeah. Aristomenes, and he tells yeah. the story of Socrates and, and Meroe and Panthea yeah. just getting back to horror films. That entire scene needs to be directed by Sam Raimi. Yeah. Evil Dead 2 era, just I just imagine yeah. those, those jump cuts and everything, yeah. like that would be so amazing. So, yeah, yeah that's on the road. Still on the road, you know, so between travelers, I mean, people, I guess. Mm-hmm typically had to walk between cities in the ancient world. Occasionally they would ride if they were lucky, I suppose, on a horse. But yeah, lots of time for meeting strangers and and, and talking stories with them. But that again brings us back to where I was before because the star of that story, the horrible witch, Meroe, is an innkeeper. (laughs) Even as far as Augustine, right? When he talks about the innkeeper, which is they give this drugged cheese to yeah, their right, guests, and, and, they, 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 yes, and they turn them into to beasts of burden and make them make them work for them. Yes, but, but, yeah. but Galen has something better than that. He, I suppose, he's making he's he's making the point of, of uh, the similarity of structure, I guess, between human flesh and pig flesh, and he and he says the proof of this is, as we all know, from time to time, innkeepers are caught murdering some of their guests and then feeding them as pork to the rest of their guests. It's a wonderful economy, isn't it, really? (laughs) And that's the proof that human flesh and pig flesh are actually rather similar. But again, I mean, that that strikes me as being a wonderful ancient example of what you might call an urban legend. Right, like the guy with the hook for a hand or whatever. Exactly. The guy with the hook or whatever. You were just talking about how these things were associated together in the mind. You have even something like Tibullus. Uh, Tibullus is doing this poem about he got the spells from the witch, hoping that the lady who's keeping his girlfriend slash prostitute away. Yes. <laughs> because that's that's he's like, may she, you know, be howling and naked. Yeah, sure. All around in tombs. Sure, exactly. It's fantastic. Yeah, there again, you see, you get the association between the werewolf and the, and the dead. Yeah. You also mentioned briefly the Lycaon myth. I'm reminded of that beautiful section in Ovid's Metamorphoses where he feeds Jove, who is the Roman equivalent of Zeus, the flesh, right? Yeah. And uh, Zeus overturns the tables. And in some of the stories, he'll kill them with lightning bolts. But in this particular one, he turns them into the wolf. And Joe was like, yeah, this is a very fitting punishment for him for what he's done. So Lycaon basically turns into a wolf and he can't speak. What are some of the other sources we have, Petronius and Pisanius especially, feature heavily in your book? So sources in terms of actually ancient authors, you mean? We've, you've mentioned Aesop. Aesop's a bit like Homer in that he didn't exist. He's a tradition rather than a person. But there's a wonderful sort of jokey tale, which is only attested quite late in the Aesopic tradition. You, you can never know really how ancient these things are. It, it might be much older. It's a tale that uses the idea of a werewolf without actually featuring a werewolf. And basically, a thief is sitting with an innkeeper, and he starts to yawn, and he tells the innkeeper that he's afflicted with werewolfism. It's a kind of some curse some sin or whatever, which is an, an interesting phrase. So the curse of the werewolf, no sort of real indication of where that curse might have been got from or how he might have got it. But no doubt that is evidence for the notion that werewolves could be created by curses. And he says, so I have this curse. And if I yawn three times, I transform into a man-eating wolf. And I need you to hold my clothes whilst I do it and keep keep them safe. This is the notion that we also find in a, in a slightly different way in the Petronius story about the werewolf needing to keep his clothes safe if he's going to be able to recover them and return to his humanity. So he's begging the, the innkeeper to keep him safe because the innkeeper is terrified. He's hanging onto the innkeeper's cloak and the innkeeper himself just runs off. That's the thief's scam, of course, the way to score a cloak. But it's curious, isn't it, that it's the innkeeper that loses a cloak, as it were, rather than the supposed werewolf figure and also, it's interesting, isn't it, that there's another innkeeper in this story, and I can't help wondering whether there might lurk behind that rather simple tale that we have, a rather more interesting tale, in which the, the innkeeper turns out to be a real wolf. Deprived of his human clothing, he becomes a wolf and then eats the thief. 
that would be a rather nice ending, it seems to me. Yes, that would be poetic justice, wouldn't it? That is a bit speculative. But uh, other sources, well, there's this dog demon of Ephesus, which Philostratus talks about, of course. Oh, the story there is is very fascinating, isn't it? But it's very strange. The werewolf, he doesn't transform how you would think in terms of our modern conception. I don't know if you could expound upon this. Well, they stone him and they pile up the stones on him. So he's completely buried. And then when they presume he's dead and they pick off the stones one by one and they find not the body of this beggar with fiery eyes that they thought they were going to find, but a huge dog. So that's a weird thing. I mean, that story you might think implies that the big dog is the default form. Do supernatural creatures revert to base form in death or not? I don't know. Or, in fact, there was the human form, nonetheless the base form, but he had the power to turn himself into a, well, let's say a big dog rather than a wolf in, in this case, and that he was just killed in the process of that transformation. You can read it either way, I suppose. He's said to have had a, a beggar's wallet with a bit of bread in it. <laughs> it's a strange detail. I mean, you wonder why is it just a bit of colour for the story? It's a fast-paced story. You sort of expect details to have a function. And I wonder whether that was the mechanism by which he was transforming himself. Well, That's a good point. Yeah. The bread really stood out to me. And what also stood out yeah. to me was, as opposed to our modern preconceptions of werewolves and their transformative aspects in antiquity, and especially in the Petronius story, the apparatus for going back to being a human is the clothes themselves. Well, so yes, yeah. And you raise a very interesting point about how the ancients viewed these creatures is whether it's a wolf with a human carapace and a wolf core or vice versa. In the Petronius story, you get the idea that the clothes come off and the guy becomes a wolf. You have to do a bit of a sleight of hand thinking here, but you sort of identify the clothes, I suppose, with the outer form, the civilized form of the human. So kind of like maybe you think sort of some sort of clothes and human skin somehow or other go together, but you take those off and then there's the wolf exposed from inside and then the guy puts his clothes back on and again the human form comes back and likewise with the thinking behind this anyway the arcadian right that we mentioned and of course the also the thinking behind the aesop story we were just talking about so in those cases yes the wolf is something inside which again stripping off the human outer carapace releases or reveals it's possible that other werewolves were regarded as having the human bit inside and the wolf on the outside by default I mean, you could read the transformation of Lecay on that way, again, as his skin suddenly is clothed over in his wolf skin. But again, perhaps a clearer example is, if we're talking about the wolf on the outside, the hero of Temessa is an example of that, isn't it? Because he, he's described as a demon in a wolf skin. So the demon is presumably humanoid and the wolf skin is on the outside. The and that hero, concept of the hairy heart as well, right? Yes, the hairy heart, that belongs rather to the wolf inside, human outside. We mentioned the name Aristomenes. Here's another Aristomenes, not related, I don't think, but Aristomenes of Messini, who was the bane of ancient Sparta. He's a wonderful figure, actually. He's the, the legendary leader of the Messenian Serfs' revolt against the Spartan oppressors. He has a wonderful suite of legends associated with him. He's a sort of combination of King Arthur and Robin Hood. When the Spartans finally catch him, they cut him open uh, for reasons unexplained, but discover that he has a hairy heart. It's not explained in context what that means. But he is associated with wolf imagery in some of his stories in various ways. And in particular, most gloriously, with fox imagery. I mean, his best story is where we repeatedly capture him and he escapes. So on one occasion, they throw him down the Kaidas Ravine, which is where they throw their criminals. This is uh, somewhere over on Mount Tegetus. And so he's going to fall down this huge crevasse due to certain death. But what seems to have happened, again, if we reconstruct the stories properly, he was thrown down in his armour, and that would include his shield with his distinctive eagle blazon on it. That seems to have come to life, become a real giant eagle, and then to have borne him gently down to the bottom so that he, he survived on reaching the bottom. But he was still trapped there, and so there he was lying in the midst of all these mouldering bodies, all the other people the Spartans had chucked down there, thinking, well, there's no way out, is there? But then he notices that a fox has come in, and he's nosing around for a meal amongst all the dead bodies. And he thinks, well, if it knows a way in, it knows a way out. So he grabs hold of its tail, and even though it's turning around to bite him all the time, he just holds on tight, and eventually it runs off through its secret little passageways, and that's how he escapes. So there's this, this wonderful uh, sort of association in that particular story between Aristomenes and, the, and another canid, a fox. Yes, as, uh, as your viewers will realise, I'm quite happy to bring in big dogs and foxes into my werewolf mix as well.
I love that. Please do, because it really enriched everything, especially when you did three haunted house folk tales that are recounted by Lucian and Philopsudes, and then you have Pliny the Younger, right, recounting yes. the same kind of story. Plautus, a simplicity in yeah. Plautus, Plautus. Yeah. 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 I, Like I said, I look at the book very much as a companion to your source book. It can be yeah. read in conjunction with that book yeah, very cool. easily, and it, it really points out the importance of this imaginative mm -hmm. kaleidoscopic literary world. And the Wealth book did actually grow very directly out of the source book in a way. In the first edition of that source book, I had to just a couple of passages, I think it was, about werewolves. And I wasn't really sure they belonged, you know, in, in a book on witchcraft, magic and ghosts. But my students really loved those. And so I built up the werewolf passages and sort of started to think about them more. And yes, they do sort of belong in the world of witches. They do belong in the world of ghosts, don't they? That's where it all came from, you see. As a result of, of the student demand, really, that's how we ended up with the werewolf book. I'm also reminded again of Ovid, Metamorphoses 8, where Medea when she's creating the concoction and mix of drugs for Aeson to restore his youth. You know, one of those things is the werewolf parts. It's insane. Um, yeah, so yeah, also yeah, the weird fantastic. impossible ingredients, exactly, yeah. So and that is another association yeah. between werewolves and witches, of course. The OGs, Medea and Cersei, those are the top two. I wanted to get back to this concept. We talked about the clothes, as the, mm. the way the wolf can change back into a human but you also make a great point in the book about the relationship of werewolves or these transformative creatures and soul projection to what we would, for lack of a better term, and this is a highly debated term in scholarship, shamanic yeah. Pythagorean traditions. Um, you just yeah. mentioned Aristeus' soul projecting out is yeah. that of a raven, like Pliny yeah. was talking about. So I don't know if you could talk about the soul projection a little bit. It is a difficult argument. It may be best actually to start with medieval material. There are dead centuries for the werewolf. I mean, after Augustine, there's virtually nothing on the werewolf, as far as I'm aware, in the surviving literature until the 12th century. And then it all explodes again very richly. And I do think that those, these stories that are told in the 12th century can be very helpful in reconstructing what was going on behind our you know, really quite fragmentary and elusive sources on the ancient side. I do believe there's this deep continuity of werewolf lore as we're throughout those dark ages. So one of the things that we hear about in these 12th century sources is precisely this, the notion, they're sort, it's sort of Christianized, but you can see what was going on behind it. This notion that the way werewolfism works is that the human werewolf chap goes into a coma, into a trance, and projects his soul out of him in the form of a tangible and terrible wolf. And it goes off and does its marauding. And that's how the transformation happens that's how it works and that does seem to be parallel to these traditions of again these people we call the greek shamans and again um, as jason said I'm, I'm not really trying to imply anything by using that term it's but it is a, a a word we use to group together a series of about five or six ancient figures who seem to be doing some interesting things uh, which resemble each other so Aristotle and Proconessus could go into a trance and then project his soul in the form of a raven which would fly around and go on voyages of discovery and the best of all here is Hermitimus of Cladzomene he did the same basically he went into a trance went into a coma his soul would project out and go wandering around and we're told in this rather nice little story about him that his enemies who wanted to do away with him prevailed upon his wife to let, let them in the house whilst he was off on one of his travels. And then they claimed, having you know found the body, that he was dead and, and burnt it so that his soul would have nowhere to return to, which indeed proved to be the case, apparently. We have a quite a similar model of action there. And what's interesting there, again, we have the unfaithful wife who sort of abets in, in sort of depriving her husband of his opportunity to return to his normal form in that way. Leap forward to the 12th century again, and again, one of the very best medieval, the earliest actually, but also the best medieval werewolf stories, the story of Bisclavre in a, a wonderful short lay of Marie de France, Anglo-Norman. And that tells the story of Bisclavre, who is a werewolf, and so a, a couple of days a week, I think it is, he goes off into the woods. As Jason mentioned before, there's always this going off into the woods, there's always this, this sort of distinction between the, the city, the place of civilization and humans, and the woods, the place of wildness and 
wolves and things like that. Anyway, goes off into the wolves, takes off his clothes, hides them under a stone, becomes a wolf, and then a couple of days later recovers his clothes and his humanity and goes back to his wife, which aligns quite nicely, really, with the Petronius chief of the clothes. One day his wife insists he tell her what's going on, and he does, and she's horrified by this notion that he's a werewolf and decides to unburden herself of him. And so she follows him into the forest, and when he's hidden his clothes, she runs off with them so that he's trapped as a wolf for many years. Eventually, of course, he does recover his form and he punishes his wife. But there's a really striking parallel between the Hermotima story and that and the Biscavere story, it seems to me. And also with the way Augustine talks about animal transformation, he again talks about animal transformation in terms of soul projection. He sort of indirectly associates it with werewolves, but his focus is more on those landladies and the beasts of burden, which we mentioned before. You put that all together, it's not a decisive case. I'll be the first to say that it's not a decisive case, but there are just so many sort of overlaps in patterns of thought, it seems to me, that that does begin to build a case that at least one strand of werewolf thinking in the ancient world was precisely in terms of the wolf comes out as, a, as the projected soul made tangible. And that was what was going on with werewolves. It's very strange. The body has to be protected and if it's not protected, I think in some stories, they find the body and then they burn it. So like I mentioned before, the werewolf book is a great companion to the magic, witchcraft, and ghost source book. The comparanda you pull from medieval tales, you mentioned Bisclavre by Maria de France. Then there's the William of Palermo story, the wolf named Alphonse. Yeah, he spends yeah. years as a wolf. He like protects this kid from <laughs> youth until he's like courting. Could you touch a little bit more upon some of the other medieval sources and how we kind of tie those into the evidence from antiquity? Well, I mean, we've talked about two examples there with Bisclavre and, and Alphonse. I mean, there are other stories like Arthur and Gorlug and things like that, but they're all quite samey. <laughs> yeah, and Alphonse is very interesting because, as you say, he, he spent many, many years as a wolf, but also sort of doing good to humans in his wolf form, in his sort of superhero form. Once you've read Bisclavre and you've read Alphonse, you've got the gist of what's going on in these early medieval stories. One that is worth mentioning separately is The Werewolves of Ossery, of course, which is a wonderful Irish story. And that is of a priest who is wandering in a forest and a chap prevails upon him to give the last rites to a wolf, which, of course, is not permitted in animals in, in Catholic thought. But he takes the chap along to where this wolf is dying and he shows him that it's his wife. His wife has been transformed into a wolf by the curse of another priest. Again, what, what are these priests getting up to really cursing people into becoming werewolves? Interesting, he proves that it's, it's really a human being, a woman inside, by pulling back. He can pull back the wolfskin to some extent and reveal the woman underneath it. To, to, so the priest goes ahead and delivers the last rites. Uh, and so the, the guy who was also a werewolf, but clearly not in wolf form at this point, uh, it was his wife, he shows him out to the forest. You know, he's, he's, he's lost his way. Uh, and again, that story is good for thinking about the issue of, you know, human inside, wolf outside. And again, the skin is very, very much definitely on the, on the outside there. And then another <laughs> uh, medieval story we, we might bring in if we go over to the Norse lands. There's this wonderful story of Siegfried and Sinfjotli, who, again, are wandering in the forest and find a, a deserted house with two wolf skins hanging up and for no particular reason put them on and find themselves trapped in them. So again, they have to live of wolves for a certain time as a result of that. That story also belongs to the notion that werewolf is human inside and wolf outside. I like the metaphor you use of kaleidoscopic layers. These stories are so dynamic and signify different things, but at the same time, very familiar, even as time mm. change. Just the, the werewolf and the, the Strix witch and these ghosts as the locus of a good story. These are like the horror films of, of the day, you know, the campfire yeah. stories. Yeah. Just fascinating discussing these topics with you leads to an open door of endless discussion. Dr. Ogden, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. This has been an honor as always. 